everyone. Uh, my talk is about Inference QL. Inference QL is a SQL-like probabilistic programming language that is implemented in Clojure. Unlike many other academic projects, Inference QL is a joint effort. Um, it's not just a grad student sitting in his corner and coding very bad code up. Um, we have a big team. Uh, well, for academic standards, a big team. Um, Bikash is the principal investigator, um, and I would like to call out Zane, who is here today. Um, he's leading our software engineering efforts and is tapping me on the finger if I do crazy science code writing. Um, Harish Tella is also here. He's doing our UX. Um, both of them are doing closure for much longer than I do. So if you have detailed questions on closure, please refer to them. Anything about the probability stuff behind, I'm happy to answer. Um, today, I will talk about um, so like three different aspects of the Inference QL project. I will start with telling you a little bit about probabilistic programs. What are they, and why are they useful for you guys? Um, I will then move on to discuss a number of different approaches for automatically constructing these programs from databases. And then I will talk a little bit about the goal of why we're actually implementing a, a, a SQL-like language in Clojure and how we plan to make inference more broadly accessible by doing that. So throughout this talk, I will work on a data set that I pulled together from the Stack Overflow developer survey that was released this year. Um, I used a subset of it, but the gist is every row in this data table is a developer. One of you guys, many of you may have filled out that survey. And every column is a question that they answered. Um, do people know Clojure? Do they know Emacs? Um, do they aspire to be a manager? And if they have a large income? I processed this data set a little bit to ensure that there's um, a balance in terms of closure and non-closure programmer because I wanted to make this demo and the statistical inference based on the data relevant for that community. Um, and um, I use a subset of the developer survey, so not all the 90,000s, but just around 500, so the stuff fits on the slide. If the first thing you might notice by looking at this data is that there is missing data, so not every, every developer actually filled out the column um, that ask whether they aspire to be a manager. That alone makes the standard statistical toolbox struggle with this data set. It might require additional processing, uh, removing of those rows, or replacing it with an estimated mean or whatnot. Um, so we have that data available, and what we really want to do is we want to model the response process that has generated that data set. So we know where the data comes from, and we have the results, but we don't know the process. And what we want to do is we want to write a program in Clojure that models this process. And there's no need to go into detail of that, of that program. I will explain more about that later, but that's the idea. And once you have that program, you can do interesting things with it. For example, you could use the program to generate data um, for visualization and testing purposes. So for example, um, you can ask this program to generate one new developer uh, that knows Clojure and then check out what are the other values in those columns. Do they know Emacs, do they know Vim or whatnot? You can also generate a distribution of developers, say a thousand, and tell the system to only generate developers that make over 130K can then look at the values in the other columns and try to draw inferences from that. But you can also ask uh, probability questions off to those programs, or post -qu probability questions to those programs. So for example, what is the probability that you use Emacs if you know Clojure? Or what is the probability that you know Clojure if you're an experienced programmer? Or finally, what is the probability that your salary is over 130K um, if you know Clojure? All of those questions can be answered with a probability, and we can get them out of our probabilistic programs. And I will show you guys how to do that in a second. But first, let's zoom in a little bit into what I mean when I say we can run 
uh, the probabilistic program to generate survey answers. So if you execute, execute those probabilistic programs once, you get a new row in your data table. This is not an observed row. This is something that comes, gets sampled out of the program. You can do this a bunch of times, and you end up with some posterior distribution over all of those dimensions that you see here, over closure, Emacs, and IntelliJ, and so on and so forth, not just individual ones. If you ask the probabilistic program to generate developer answers conditionally, for example, conditioned on the knowing closure, you can repeat the game. You see that um, the closure column is now all true, um, but the other columns now should faithfully represent the values that they should take on given that developer knows closure. So they should not just be the same values that would have spit out in the previous um, process of generating data. Uh, the use cases for probabilistic programs that may or may not be relevant for you are, for example, if you want to know, given data set of customers, who probably makes enough money to purchase my product? Or given a data set of rental listings that contains errors, what are cleaned records most likely to be? Yesterday there was a talk about probabilistic record linkage for, for hospital records. Um, that's another thing you can ask a probabilistic program to do. Or given wet lab experiments on gene interactions, you could ask the program, what is the probability if you modify one gene that it doesn't influence any other genes in the genome and thus might cause downstream effects that you don't want to, uh, want to see in your organism? Uh, and finally, given data about cluster runtime, is a job likely to succeed and how much cost will probably incur before doing so? So those are interesting questions, but how do we actually do that? And that's where sort of like the closure bit comes uh, to mind. We can construct those programs by looking at data. And I will show you now three progressively better ways. We will start with a very simple model where we just count proportions in our data and put the prior accordingly. We um, look at a more complex model where we try to model conditional distributions. And then I'll show you a process where we do it completely automatically via approach that we call Bayesian synthesis of probabilistic programs, where we have a prior on, this, on the space of domain-specific programs, um, where we then do inference over and get a posterior distributions of programs out. So let's start with the first model. The first model we call a count model. So all that model does is it simply looks at the occurrences in the columns and tries to count uh, uh, the fractions of true and false, and then assigns a probability. I will do that for a subset of the columns only so that my slides stay readable. Um, so we're looking only at closure, Emacs, whether or not somebody is experienced, and whether or not their income is larger than 130K. Um, again, I assembled that data set in a, in a way that we have 50% closure programmers and 50% not, um, but all the other the distributions are more interesting, and most of them tend towards uh, uh, be in higher, assigning higher probability to, to have a false value. Now, if you wanted to write that program in closure, you could resort to the meta-probabilistic programming language, which is what we do here. Um, so gen and at are meta-prop macros. Gen just refers to this thing being a generative, what we call a generative function, and at means we tracing random choices. Um, if you're interested in what that really means, you can check out our GitHub repo on, on Metaprop, or you can check out last year's talk by uh, Vikash Mansinka, um, who is the PI in our lab. Um, that talk, won't, like my talk, will not be about that issue, about that subject. But um, to understand that code, um, just sort of like try to think of this as a simple program that uh, returns four Boolean values, one for closure, one for Emacs, and one for whether or not it's experienced, and so on. And each of those true and false values get generated by a biased coin flip. The coin flip for closure um, is 0 0.5, the bias, so we're equally likely to flip either. Um, but the counts for the other columns suggest it's like more biased coin flips for that. Now, this is where inference QL comes into play. So inference QL is a query language for models. So what we're trying to do is we want to take any probabilistic model, 
and be in a position where we can ask the same questions or the same types of questions to any different model. So if we wanted to simulate new data from this model, for example, we would call the closure function simulate, um, give it the name of the model we're looking at right now, which is the count model. Um, the empty map refers to conditions. So remember when I said maybe we want to simulate um, from that model conditions on somebody knowing closure. Um, and then you give it the number of simulations you want. Um, that's the closure backend of the inference scale query that we call generate everything, as in like, all the values that the model can generate using a specific model, and we name that model. Um, so if we do that, we can generate virtual developers as we did before. Now, is this a good model? On a first glance, it doesn't look bad. We do get the fractions right for closure, which seems logical, we do get the fraction right for Emacs. So it seems to be doing okay, or is it? Because this model doesn't know anything about interactions in your data. So it doesn't know that the data suggests that um, if you know closure, you're more likely um, to know Emacs. Um, so the distributions about interactions start to get bad. And this is logical because there's no concept in that program that somehow links the random choice called closure to the random choice called Emacs. So closure programs are different. So maybe let's write a different program. Um, uh, and we'll do that by just like trying to extend the count model we, we, we've been running before. So in order to create our coin weights, our bias coin weights, we're not looking at the fractions for the entire data table anymore, but let's split the data table in half and look at only the fractions that know closure and the fractions that don't know closure and com compute the, the, the bias coin weights for Emacs experienced and income larger than on a 30K um, on those relevant subsets and then flip coins accordingly. So what that program means is you first flip a coin for closure, then you check um, if that coin flip is true or false, and then you flip coins for the other values accordingly. And note that we call the exact same function simulate or generate all using, but we use a different model here now. So we can basically use the same machinery to query our model than we used before. And this does produce the right pairwise interactions that were missed previously, but it misses other ones. And if you, following what I'm saying, you kind of think, okay, but you can't count all the, the sort of like core occurrences because you will very quickly end up in regimes where there's very little data observed and also this like space of, of like dependencies just explodes. So what do you want to do about that? And here is where automated uh, Bayesian data modeling comes into place. And we use a, an algorithm that we call Bayesian synthesis, where we throw in a sparse database or data table, we add in some constraints, both qualitative and quantitative assumptions, um, and that algorithm spits out not only one, but an ensemble of probabilistic programs. Those probabilistic programs then can be uh, uh, queried using the query language, either the SQL-like query language or the closure implementation in order to get answers. So what is the synthesis actually doing? And the answer is what it's doing is um, modern Monte Carlo inference. Like, I won't go into much detail what that like, jargony term really means, but intuitively, we are, Monte Carlo inference is based on sampling, and what we are sampling is column groupings, so we sample different so like partitions amongst columns, which columns are to be treated dependently and independently. Then for each of these groupings that we call views, we um, partition all the rows, those we call clusters, so we cluster all the developers, but independently for each grouping. And you could view each of the cluster as having its own count model, but it's not a naive count model um, as the ones that I, I just showed, but it's using what the Bayesians call the conjugate good prior, um, and it's actually, trying, well, you could see it as a way of smoothing the counts in order to account for uncertainty, especially in cases where um, you only have few observations because your data set is sparse. So what you see on the right is sort of like this random partitioning and shuffling of rows and column uh, um, uh, dependencies. And this is still like to the beginning, at the beginning of inference, so we're pretty close to the prior, we're shuffling more or less randomly around. Um, 
But if you move on with inference to more inference, you can see how you start to get a more structured view and how your data should be partitioned or grouped. Um, specifically, Clojure and Emacs are strongly dependent. Um, Aspire to be a manager seems to be more or less independent, but it's not yet clear yet. Um, and we're moving on to do more and more inference. Um, what we're basically seeing here is that we're generating um, a specific, like, this partitions can be viewed as a specific DSL, including so like the parameters for how data should be generated. And that's what we're sampling um, iteratively until we reach a state that is approximately the posterior. One way to view this is like as a very shallow symbolic gener uh, gener generative adversarial network. And if time progresses, you run a lot of those sampling steps, um, eventually you will converge to something that is around the posterior. And that implies that there's a bunch of groupings uh, for closure, Emacs, IntelliJ, Vim, Experience, and large income. Um, but all of those columns are treated independently to whether or not somebody aspires to be a manager. Um, so that is the posterior sort of like dependency structure that we get out of this. And there's still wiggling because um, this is a Bayesian method, so you reach the posterior, but we will always preserve some uncertainty about how rows should be clustered. Now, when I talked about DSL, um, we represent this enclosure as a simple Eden uh, data structure. So what we learn is a data structure that is structured as follows. So first, um, each column gets assigned a statistical data type that can either be inferred from the data or it can be a, a qualitative constraint. Oftentimes, you want it to be a qualitative constraint because you know that all of those um, um, variables are Boolean or categorical, which is the same in, in, in that sense um, for, for binary variables. Um, so you know that in advance, so you, can either, you, you don't have to infer it, you can just insert it to the system as a constraint. Then the next field marks those views, as in the column groupings. Um, and inside each of those views that collect sets of dependent variables, you then have the clustering. And this clustering is similar to a Gaussian mixture model. So you have a mixing weight or a probability with which you choose a certain cluster, which is described here. So with probability 0 0.22, we, and if we sample data, we sample from the first cluster. Um, and if we do, we flip the coin or the categorical in, in this case with the following uh, probabilities. And note that in this list, because Aspire to be a manager is independent, this is in a different view. We don't sample a weight from here uh, for this here. It's not clustered with the other columns. There's other clusters here. So if, if you don't sample the first cluster, you end up with a completely different set of uh, 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 parameters if you sample this cluster. What then happens is, again, I, I won't go into too much detail about that slide, but we are reading in this, uh, what we call a spec, um, this, this Eden data structure into this function here. And all that function does is it turns it into a, a um, generative program. So again, we're using the metaprop programming language to trace random choices. Um, but if you supply this program with a uh, spec like this, then what you get out is a probabilistic program that if you execute it, um, generates new rows, and you can feed it into the inference QL uh, code base and the, the query primitives and ask questions about the program that comes out of that. And it turns out that this thing models interactions much more, much more accurately. So for example, what we're seeing here is we're not only looking at pairwise interaction, but three ways interactions. And if we just slide over the data table, we're actually getting interactions that more are, are pretty faithful uh, to, to the data. So we're much more accurate than our naive model. And we are able to treat a larger data set easily. Once we have that, we can start asking probability questions. So I showed you before how you can generate new data and conditionally generate new data. But as you've seen, there's probability quantities contained in the probabilistic program now. So you can ask questions about probabilities in your, uh, that you have about your data set. For example, what is the probability that you use Emacs if you know closure? So as you've seen, we can generate data. So intuitively, you could just generate 1,000 data points 
and compute the fraction. Um, the inference query that does that um, is, um, is, is shown below. Um, and what that happens is it, it, we parse this query into a closure function called simulate um, and simulate data accordingly. Um, and you can see there's a, quite a significant shift between the generated data for Emacs, using Emacs given that somebody knows closure um, compared to using Emacs given somebody doesn't know closure. Well, we can actually do better. We can ask the program for those probabilities directly because they're now in the program. They live in the program. We just can compute them with doing the right uh, transformations of that program or that data structure. So with a different query, namely instead of generate, we ask the model to compute the probability of Emacs being true given that closure is true using the baseline model that we generated. And we can see there's quite a significant shift in terms of the probabilities that we get out. Now finally, we can even get a distribution over those probability values to get a sense of how confident we are actually in our result. So if, if you remember the schematic that I showed earlier, I said we are not only generating one heuristic program, but ensembles. So what I do in this case is I ask the Bayesian synthesis algorithm to spit out 100 probabilistic programs, as in 100 of those Eden structure that get turned into probabilistic programs. Um, and then I will, for each of them, compute the probability um, of Emacs true given closure being true and of Emacs true given closure being false. And you can see that all of the 100 models that we learn from data basically agree. There's some a little bit of, of, a, of a distribution around what the real probability should be, but they're more or less in line when it comes to the shift. I should say that the syntax we're using here is still not under development. So all of like the entire query runs perfectly fine in, in, in enclosure, but we're experimenting with the semantics of sampling from, from multiple models in terms of how we should re represent it as a SQL-like query language. Um, because we want to both be faithful to probability semantics and make it comprehensible to users. Um, but and this is no problem to run enclosure at all. Um, and you could emulate it by just wrapping closure around the SQL calls. Um, another question we wanted to ask is, what is the probability to know closure if you're an experienced programmer? So the query stays more or less the same, only so like the target of probability off and to condition changes. So now we compute the probability of uh, somebody knowing closure or the model uh, uh, registering closure as true given uh, experience is true. And we compare the same thing as compared to given experience is false. Um, we are still fairly confident on the shift. However, from the 100 models that we are synthesized, um, in both queries, two of them seem to be um, peaking around 0 0.5. And that happens because if you remember this synthesis algorithm, what we're doing is grouping columns. So out of the 100 columns, uh, two decided that closure and experience should be independent. 98 didn't, but two decided they should be independent. And thus, the probability of closure being true, given experience being true, is the same as the probability of closure being true by itself without the condition. Because in those two, those two models in the ensembles that we synthesized treated as independently. That's why we have in both, like, both sort of like queries, we have this peak around 0 0.5 because that's just the marginal distribution where the condition actually doesn't matter. A similar thing we see here for the probability that your salary is over 130K if you know closure. Um, uh, we again have I think, yeah, it's two models that uh, peak, uh, that, that treat income independent of closure, and those two models um, compute the marginal of income being higher than under 30K. Um, all the other models shift from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 in terms of the probability. So there's a change. So what does this mean? Like, which kind of questions can we answer uh, on the Stack Overflow data? What is interesting for you? We could ask, what language should I learn to maximize the chance of raising my salary more than 10K? Or what if I could learn two languages? Would that change um, how much I can earn? You can also ask, what languages have the biggest gender gap? And with what confidence can we answer that, assuming response rate is independent of gender? 
um, what is the probability that you're underpaid given your skills and thus might appreciate if I try to poach you? We are hiring. Um, <laughs> so to go back to this schematic, I only showed you a sub-process of, of what we're actually doing. I didn't talk all that detailed about the qualitative and quantitative constraints. I mentioned qualitative constraints in light of the data types of our columns, but we can actually do more. For example, we can tell the system to ensure that two columns are dependent or independent. So for example, take the Stack Overflow data set and say you wanted to use it to predict how much you should pay someone. But that's a historical data set. What if there's a pay gap in terms of gender recorded in that data set for historical reasons or whatnot? You don't want to reproduce that. Um, so you can tell the synthesis algorithm, okay, to keep gender independent in all those like different models in your sum that you generate from, um, from, from, from uh, how much, what they should earn, but do everything else the same otherwise. In that case, if you could, like conditioning on the gender won't change anything. We can also add in quantitative assumptions. So something that we have done uh, in Europe's uh, 2016 um, and recently reproduced with this new version of the query language in Clojure is we can insert um, knowledge, physical knowledge about satellites and how they circle the Earth and combine it with this automatically synthesized stuff into a probabilistic program that has the best of both worlds in the sense that we can use the automated synthesis for all the columns in the data table where we have um, no idea how we should model them, but then for a subset of the satellites, we know they follow Kepler's law. Kepler's law is just a few lines of code um, to write a probabilistic model about, insert that in, uh, and then improve my predictions about what the satellite should be doing, um, given what I learned from the data, and given my quantitative sort of like knowledge that I have um, about those satellites. It, all, it can also serve to test and check hypotheses, right? And then finally, I showed you a few ways of analyzing programs and querying um, uh, 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 programs that we generated. But if you really, you can actually ask much more sophisticated questions in the sense that you could ask, okay, if I have two columns, how probabilistically dependent are they in my data set? So one way to do this is just look at the ensemble of programs you generated and check how often two programs, uh, so sort of like in the same uh, 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 column grouping for, for generating their values. That's a very simple way to do it, but it's statistically sound in the sense it gives you a nice upper bound on mutual information of two columns. You can also compute mutual information directly in the sense that you look at two random choices in your program um, and use the probabilistic capabilities of sampling and assessing the probability of those samples to compute the mutual information values between two random choices directly. And um, that gives you another sound statistical estimate of whether or not two columns should be dependent in a similar way that people would use linear correlation to check dependency between variables, but much more expressive in the sense that um, you can process much richer data types and you can process nonlinear uh, non relationships, missing data, and so on. So what are we trying to do with all this? The main goal is to make inference more broadly accessible. Um, Example applications that we've been working on include like two startups that came out of the lab. Um, one prior knowledge was acquired uh, by Salesforce in 2012, and the other one was acquired by Empirical System. Uh, it was acquired by Tableau in 2018, which I guess is now Salesforce. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that's mostly the work of my boss. I am much more interested in the public interest work in the sense that um, I work on a project where we try to learn models for the entire genome to help uh, synthetic biologists to do gen genetic engineering more robustly. Here, we have data tables that have 4,000 columns, and we are modeling 1,000 rows and just trying to see, you know, if you condition on one gene, what is the effect on the second gene? What is the effect on all the genes and so on? So that they can sort of like guide their engineering process um, given the data that have available. And they need a query language because they're not going to learn closure. Um, we also help data journalists. We work um, with the New York Times um, to process census data to direct uh, field journalism. Um, so 
journalist as well, we'll probably not learn closure. Um, we work on the United Nations Sustainable Development Index um, to reduce redundancies and detect dependencies in the data and to understand which countries are actually doing good or not. Uh, and we're working on a project about child psychology where we try to improve mental health screening questionnaires by reducing the redundancies. And the context here is that if you follow state of the art and you really want to diagnose a mental health issue, in theory, you would have to ask a kid um, questions from 10 to 20 questionnaires. Each comes with, you know, 50 questions, meaning you're going to ask the kid a thousand questions, which is impossible. But a lot of those questions are redundant. And by looking at data that exists from those questionnaires and trying to understand which random choices and the programs that we synthesize from the data are actually dependent um, and predictive of each other, we might get rid of redundant stuff. So why are we targeting, targeting a SQL-like language? In order to explain this, I'd invite you to look at this diagram, which is trying to explain what data science is. Um, this is not my diagram. I, I took this from the web. It's by uh, Andrew Silva, Andrew Conway. Um, the most important thing about this diagram is you have these three axes. Um, you have automation, validity, and intuition. Um, and if you have domain expertise and you know how to code, you probably do some traditional software applications on your data. If you have domain expertise um, and you have some knowledge of statistics, like statistics 101, if you're a biologist, for example, um, you will oftentimes end up in the traditional research area. Um, and if you know how to code well and can process complex math from multivariate statistics, you end up in the danger zone that is called machine learning. Um, now, there's currently, you know, 75,000 stats bachelors in, in, in the States. Um, we have roughly 100 million Excel users worldwide and 20 million developers. But we really want to empower not only programmers, but people on the intersection people who code, and people who have domain knowledge about what's going on. And that is why we are targeting SQL users, of which there are roughly uh, 10 million worldwide. And what SQL really did a couple of decades ago, it, it allowed um, people to think logically about their data. Um, and it did so without having them to think about how that data is represented on the machine. And Cott, in his seminal paper, actually put this really succinctly. In the first sentence, he, he wrote, um, future users of large data banks must be protected from having to know how the data is organized in the machine. Um, and that's why SQL was so successful, because suddenly business analysts who just wanted to compute averages for certain conditions didn't have to learn how to program. And that is inspiring to us in the sense, this, in the sense for our research, as in we want to understand, can we enable a similar sort of like order of magnitude of people to think probabilistically? And I mean, I'm here, so first we target programmers and analysts, um, because a lot of programmers like SQL, and our stuff happens to be implemented in Clojure. Um, but we also want to target, for example, spreadsheet users who work in traditional science. Um, because we use Clojure, we can compile our stuff to Clojure script, and we have produced a very nice spreadsheet app uh, with a little text box where you can run your queries, um, where somebody can try to get like insights in their data without having to learn um, much coding at all. Um, we want to target statistics, data scientists, and machine learning engineers as well, because as you've seen, you can easily swap models to ask the same question. So if you want to compare the performance of different models, you can do that with our language. Um, because SQL is more similar to structured English, we hope that we can use this to also teach students and executives to think probabilistically without having to deal with, you know, paper-wise of Greek that is written in a declarative style, um, which is how math normally is taught. And finally, we want to support AI researchers and research in probabilistic programming um, because we want to motivate people to contribute and to, to help us integrated this in, in data lakes, data pipelines, and web applications. Thank you. I'll...